Hey everyone, welcome to Church Online. It's so great to see you this morning. My name is Saida. And hi, I'm Eva. We are so thankful that you decided to spend a part of your Sunday morning with us. If you joined us last week, we kicked off our new sermon series, Made New to Renew, and Pastor Sunder brought us such an encouraging word. Also, we would love to hear from you. So why don't you go ahead, say hi in the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. And during the next hour together, we invite you to just lean in and encourage you to just be fully present as we sing together, pray together, read from the scriptures, and also have the privilege to hear another message from Pastor Sunder. Before we get started, we have an exciting announcement for you parents. Our Bayview Kids Summer Camp signup is officially open as of today. Our kids camp is so amazing. It's a full week packed with fun activities for your children as they get to know and experience God's love and learn more about Jesus. Also, if you're interested in serving alongside us at camp, we would love to hear from you. You can head to our website at bayviewglen.org camp for everything you need to know. Church, would you join us in prayer before we begin today's service? Dear God, we are just so thankful that we are able to come together as a church to worship you and just hear from your word today. I just pray that as Pastor Sender speaks, that we would just lean in and we would be transformed by your spirit. God, I just pray over everyone watching and tuning into today. And would you just bless today's service? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church, hear these words from Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? and the Son of Man, that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the seas, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth.
are the chosen one bring many sons to glory On Easter, we celebrated the fact that Christ has come and brought peace with us. Peace between us and God, peace with us and ourselves, and peace between us and each other. And so the church, whenever it gathers, takes time to pass the peace, to make peace where there is discord, or to share this peace with one another. And we are gonna join into this great tradition today. So there's two options for you. If you're physically joining right now with some other people beside you, would you take these next few minutes to gather together, to pray for one another, where there needs to be peace in your lives, or you can pray for peace in the world. But if you're not with anyone right now, I would encourage you to send a text to someone in your life who you can share this peace with and set up a time. Set up a time to call them, maybe set up a time to have a meal or go on a walk. But would we be marked as those who have peace and share peace with the world? Would the grace and peace of Jesus Christ be with you?
I have a question for you. I want you to think of an adjective that you can use, maybe one more than one, to describe your work. Energizing, boring, stimulating, challenging, difficult. What is an adjective that comes to mind when you think about work? Now, if I had a chance to take a poll and to see how many of you came up with negative adjectives and how many of you came up with positive adjectives and I had to bet on the outcome, I would bet that the number of negative adjectives exceeded the number of positive adjectives. And you might say, why? And by the way, you're not alone. A 2013 Gallup poll on the state of the American workplace showed that workers are growing more disengaged from their work of the approximately 100 million people in North America who hold full-time jobs 30% are engaged and inspired. 50% are disengaged, or what Gallup described as a kind of present but not inspired by their work or their managers, and a full 20% are actively disengaged. Disengaged employees are more likely to steal from their companies, negatively influence their co-workers, miss work days, and drive customers away. And what is even more startling was that Spirituality of faith doesn't seem to have any effect upon this, or not even a scene correction. Tim McGuire, who is a former editor of the Minneapolis Star Tribune and a former president of the American Society of Newspaper Editors, speaking at a faith, religion, and value seminar, said this, work is brutal. Work is a fall at a word. Most people don't think that work could possibly have anything to do with spirituality. They assume that these two worlds cannot mesh. But if we bring our souls to work, then we can transform our work. That is when our work can begin to transform us. The problem for most people is that their work transforms them into something bad, something bitter and tired, and something broken. If ever there was an area in our lives, therefore, that needed this invasion of the resurrected life of Jesus Christ so that new people can become renewed, it is in this area of the workplace. Being made, made new to be renewed in our work. And by the way, if any of you here are retired, don't tune me out. I've been retired for about six years and I'm still learning stuff about my past work that I should have done differently. And I'm beginning to address that in some areas of my life. Or maybe I have children, grandchildren. You have too. So there's every good reason for you to continue to be learning along this. And there may be others of you who either haven't started, you even got your first job yet. Young people, listen to me. Or those who are in between jobs and are going to be employed again. All of you, all of us have reason to look at this to be made, made new, to be renewed in the workplace. And it's not just something that's dictated by statistics. The Bible says an awful lot about the importance of work. For example, I didn't do this research myself, but it came across it. Work in scripture. Work in its different forms is mentioned more than 800 times in the Bible, more than worship, music, praise, and singing combined. Jesus spent his adult life as a carpenter until age 30 in preparation for his teaching and preaching ministry that only lasted three years. Of 132 public appearances of Jesus in the New Testament, 122 were in the marketplace. Jesus called 12 workplace individuals, not clergy, to build his church. Of the 52 parables Jesus told, 45 had a workplace context. Of 40 divine interventions recorded in the book of Acts, which is the early church, 39 were in the marketplace. What I want to do today as we continue this series on Made New to be Renewed, is to build a framework for renewal in our work, whatever that may be like. Number one, watch out for pride. Why? The desert fathers who cataloged our, our chief sins under the title of the seven deadly sins had pride as the deadliest of the seven deadly sins. Why? Because it was the essence of the mindset of the devil. The scripture portrays the devil as being made or created initially as a glorious being, but not satisfied with his glory, with his beauty, with his perfection, with his wisdom, wanted to make himself equal to God. If not surprisingly, it was the essence of the first temptation in the Garden of Eden. Eve was tempted to eat the forbidden fruit, not just because it was good to look at, aesthetically pleasing, good to eat, which was 
physically appealing, it was also desirable to gain wisdom, to become like gods themselves. That's what hooked them. Not surprisingly, it is ubiquitous. In other words, everybody struggles with it. There are some sins that affect me, some sins that are not an issue in my life. And all of us are like that. But pride is ubiquitous. And uh, C.S. Lewis in his inimitable fashion was illustrated this way. He said, think of the time when you were ever in a group and a group photograph was taken. And when you saw the photograph, who did you look at first? Yes, yourself. And what usually determines whether the photographer did a good job or not, it's how well you turned out, right? Because otherwise you wouldn't be showing that to anybody else as well. And it has a real opportunity, pride, I mean, to flourish in the workplace. Way back in the book of Genesis, at the beginning of history, prehistory, certainly before patriarchal history, the story of Abraham began. In Genesis chapter 11, there's the story of the building of the tower. God had told his people, humanity, to spread out, to multiply, to scatter. Instead of an act of rebellion, they said, no, we will consolidate. And they built the Tower of Babel. And in Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, the mindset behind that is this. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed. We'll do the exact opposite of what God told us because we want to build a name for ourselves. For the tower, you can substitute the academic ladder, the social ladder, the corporate ladder, whatever ladder you want. But it's all about building that name for yourself. It's ambition. And Eugene Peterson in his book, Earth and Altar, has this observation about that ambition is actually aspiration gone wrong. He says, our culture encourages and rewards ambition without qualification. We are surrounded by a way of life in which betterment is understood as expansion, as acquisition, as fame. There it is, fame, building a name for ourselves. Everyone wants to get more. To be on top, no matter what it is the top of, is admired. Aspiration, on the other hand, is an impatience with mediocrity, which is good. It is the channeled creative energy that moves us towards growth in Christ, shaping goals in the spirit. But if we take energies that make for aspiration, remove God from the picture, replacing him with our own crudely sketched self-portrait, we end up with ugly arrogance or ambition. And this is always divisive. Pride is not only ubiquitous, pride and the ambition that flow from it is always divisive. Here's why. Because pride is not content in being rich. It has to be richer than. Pride is not content in being clever. It has to be cleverer than. Pride is not content in being beautiful. It has to be more beautiful than. But now you have two people who are proud. Each one wants to be better than the other. That's not possible. Logically, if A is more intelligent than B, B is less intelligent than A, but wants to be more intelligent than A, what does that do to their relationship? Do you see why the workplace is so chaotic, so difficult? Why most people choose negative adjectives for it? Because pride is rampant, ambition is rampant, and it tends to divide people all the way. So watch out for pride in the workplace and you need to actively counter it with the mind of Jesus Christ. That's why we people who've been made new in Christ need renewal in the workplace to counter this issue of pride by Jesus. And in that magnificent passage in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, the incarnation passage, which I guess captures, if you will, the exact polar opposite of this ambition of the Tower of Babel mentality. We read those well-known words, have this mind amongst yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Only we never read this usually in the context of the workplace, right? We think about how we should behave in church. But he's not, the workplace is what I want to talk to you about, renewal. He says, have this mind amongst yourself, which was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, Satan wanted to make himself like God. Satan tempted Adam and Eve to become like God. He already was in the form of God. But he did not count equality with God something to be grasped at. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, therefore God has exalted him and bestowed on them the name, even the name they were looking to make for themselves, 
the name that was above every other name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the, the quintessential demonstration of humility, huma, humility. Sorry, And this word grasp what Jesus did not do, it's interesting, it doesn't occur anywhere else in the New Testament. It's almost like Paul coined it in here. And if we look at the contemporary usage of that word, the most likely meaning of, of this grasping is taking something that you have as an advantage, but not using it to promote yourself. Instead, using it to promote and bless other people, which is the essence of that mindset of servitude. So though he was equal with God, though he had that status, that power, instead of using it for self-promotion, he becomes a servant to be able to promote other people to it. And that downward mobility went all the way to the cross. Ambition, climbing the ladder, making a name for self is upward mobility. Look at Jesus' downward mobility. He was God, he became a man. He was man, he became a servant. He was servant, he went all the way to the cross, a punishment that was deserved, that was reserved for the criminals. It was one step down, one step down, one step down, one step down, so as to elevate other people. And all the while, he waited for God to exalt him. And that's what happened eventually. Therefore, because he chose this path of downward mobility, refusing to promote himself, but serving to build others up, he was exalted in due time and was given that name. He didn't make it for himself. He held it loosely, and he was given that name above every other name. It is this mindset. Now you can see how relevant it is. If pride and ambition flourish in the workplace and are divisive and lead to this toxicity that seems to be experienced by so many, you can see why knee needing to be renewed with the mind of Jesus. Salvation made our minds renewable, not new. The day after you became a Christian, you think exactly the same way you thought before. It's new, capable of being made, but not new yet. That's why we are called to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And so it is this mindset of downward mobility in the workplace. And now, what does that look like? I want to take you to a very surprising character, and yet we shouldn't be so surprised if you knew the whole Bible well. We're going to bridge from Jesus' mindset in 33 AD to the workplace in 2021, 21st century by looking at a man that you actually know quite well, King David. You know, there's 14 chapters in the Bible on Abraham. There's 14 chapters on Jacob, uh, on, on uh, 11, sorry. 14 to Joseph, 66 to King David. Do you know that? The central story in the Bible is the story of King David. We know far more about David than we know about anybody else in the Bible. Not only David's outside life, but because David wrote so many of the Psalms, we know so much more about David's interior life as well. There's nobody else that we know that much about in the Bible. And the interesting thing is he was a layman. He was not a prophet. He was not a pastor. He was not a priest. He was not an ecclesiastical teacher. He was a layman. The central story in the Bible is the story of a lay person. That's why all of you are listening, the bulk of you are listening to me, who are laymen and laywomen. Don't ever say, I'm just a layman. Because the central story in the Bible is about you. And it's about you. Yeah, you can say he was a, a shepherd, a king, doesn't matter. He was both. He was a, a man who worked like you did and I did. The other thing that Eugene Peterson points out in his book on earthy spirituality, Leap Over a Wall, is that there isn't a single miracle recorded in the whole life of David. So the one man about whom we know the most in the Bible, both externally and internally, there isn't a single miracle. In other words, it is what one man called the splendor of the ordinary. The story of David trains us to look for splendor in the ordinary. It is looking for splendor God showing up in our life from Monday to Saturday, not on Sundays. What did he do, David? Well, first and foremost, he looked after sheep. Even after Samuel had been directed by God to anoint David, the youngest in Jesse's family, 
after he was anointed king, what did he do? The guy, the future king, went back to serve as a sheep, shepherd boy and for quite a while. And what did he do? Interesting. There's some interesting thing that David did as he was looking after his sheep. David learned to get in touch with his soul. What was going on inside of him? So if a psalm like Psalm 8, which begins, it would seem, with a celebration of God's greatness. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. He ends with the same statement. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. In between, what would you expect to find? If someone is focusing on the greatness of God, he'd probably come away feeling kind of small. But here he is, probably the sheep bedded down for the night, looking up at the starry sky on the Judean hillside. And he actually feels pretty good about himself. You know what he says? What is man? What is man that you're mindful of him? Or the son of man that you should think of him? You know why, God? You know why you think about us? You're just, you made us just a little lower than the angels. Huh. Atheistic science would tell us that we're just a little bit better than the monkeys. David said, no, I'm just a little bit less than God. But you made him just a little bit lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and you made, put him in charge of everything. David looks inside while he's a shepherd boy. No social ladder, no economic ladder, no academic ladder to climb. And he feels utterly significant amid this thought. Why? Because he sees his significance in terms of doing what God had told him to put him in charge. So watching over sheep, tending over creation was what made it worthwhile and glorious for him. And whatever he found on the inside, he took to God in prayer. Not only in praise, therefore his reflections about himself, to prevent them from becoming arrogance or pride, are sandwiched between the greatness of God on either side. But he also looks inside and is not afraid to look at what was not right. Psalm 19, after he celebrates the law of the Lord, what does he say? He said, reveal my hidden sins. Who can know what is going on inside? The fault lines. Keep thy servant from presumptuous sins. Then I might be free from the great transgression. Your law is more sweeter than gold, but by them is your servant warned. David exposes his heart to the warning functions of the word of God. And he sees some tendencies, hidden flaws on the inside. He names them and he spreads them out before God. And then in Psalm 139, another long exposition, a meditation on God's law. He says, search me, O God, know my heart today. See if there be any hurtful, harmful way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David spends that quiet time of relative obscurity when there isn't global fame and full schedules for him to get in touch with his soul, to look at what's going on inside, both to celebrate what is good and to honestly acknowledge what is out of kilter. He looks inside and he takes what he finds inside to God. And then he sets what I find also to music and poetry. David sings. <laughs> and you know, it was the singing that took him to the palace, remember? That's what got him there. Uh, otherwise, he would not gone because Saul was in a total mess and evil spirit was troubling him. And somebody said, go find someone who can sing and play music for you. And David came. And by the way, he did the same thing. The, he, first, he was looking after sheep, protecting them from the bears and protecting them from the lions. And then here he was, shaping and ordering a king's inner life that the, that the demonic forces were ripping apart. In both cases, David was countering the effects of sin by doing a godlike work, shaping and reshaping and refilling a sheep in one case and a king in another case. He didn't know he was going to become future king or what that would look like. His song was what took him to the palace. So when you look at the life of David, those are some of the things that I see. He got in touch with his soul. He took what was inside to God. He set it to music, because music has a wonderful power, ability to order things. Alan Bloom, a professor at the closing of the American mind, said this. He said, armed with music, 
man can damn rational doubt. Why? Because music provides the unquestioned authentication for every activity that it accompanies. Music has an incredible integrating power. That's why so often, even our theological uh, assertions that may not penetrate us and affect us suddenly become effective when we sing them. So you might hear as even a sermon saying, God loves you and you want to believe that, we're not quite sure. And then the worship team gets up and they're saying, oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I am found, leaves the 99, there's shadow, no shadow he won't light up, no mountain he won't climb up, no lies he won't tear down, no what, hey, and you are singing, yes, that God loves me. That's the power of music. That's what David did. That's how David endured, although he wouldn't have even used the word endured. That's how David thrived in obscurity, waiting for the day when God would exalt him. Maybe he wasn't even waiting for that day. He, maybe he didn't even understand what this anointing by Samuel is all about. He was just happy to go back to his sheep and he looked after the sheep. He sang, his songs took him to the palace and got him ready. So for us, as we allow the mindset of Jesus to come into the workplace, we might be in an obscure place for a long time. Others might get overlooked. If, you, if you're busy doing what Jesus did, which is not thrusting yourself forward, but developing the people under you and your peers to lift them up, they might all be getting promoted ahead of you. And you might be consigned to obscurity for a while, or you're overlooked. You're gonna thrust yourself forward, you're going to backbite. You're going to sulk and pull the other person down. Yeah, that's what happens in the workplace. That's why it's so toxic. Or are you going to be renewed with the mind of Jesus and learn from King David? And of course, the connection between David and Jesus isn't exactly accidental, is it, in the scriptures? Jesus was the true son of David. So in obscurity, in the value of obscurity in the workplace, do exactly what David did. First and foremost, get in touch with yourself. Look inside. Our reactions to what happens in the workplace are often a clue as to some things that God wants to do in our lives. We need to develop an awareness of what we are feeling, not just what we are thinking. We need to develop an awareness of what we are feeling and why we are feeling that. I remember a time when someone in the congregation came and gave me a book to read on a theological subject and said, we'll meet sometime later. And I started dreading that meeting. Why? And by the way, for me, my pastoral work was my workplace. So I had to ask myself, why, why are you dreading this meeting that's gonna come up? Well, first of all, I knew this book was a well-researched and well-read book. And the individual, my friend, is a clear, logical thinker like me, which means if he was recommending the book, it probably was a good, very persuasive book which meant I might have to change my mind, which meant I'd probably have to start teaching it, which meant some people who had been very good to me in the church might have got upset with me. It also meant I now had to find time to read this book and my time, life was already quite busy. Okay, why are those things bothering me? And it traced back down to two things in my life. I don't like change. <laughs> And I also don't like dealing with angry people. If I hadn't stopped to ask why was I dreading this, I wouldn't have unearthed those two things. My reactions pointed out to something that was happening with me. And then I had to do what David did, which is sort of get in touch with yourself and then whatever you find, take to God in honest prayer. In my case, I had to acknowledge to God, God, if it's the time factor, then I don't believe that you're sovereign over time, right? And if I'm afraid and it's courage that I need, I'm being a coward and I need you for both those things. It's got traced to unbelief in God's lordship over time in one case and in the fear that I had of man, which the Bible says is a snare. This is, this is what it, and so I began to pray about both of those things. Now, what happened in that particular situation is irrelevant because what I want to illustrate for us is, is the fact that in the workplace, get in touch with what is going on inside. Learn to look inside. Ask, what am I feeling? And then ask, why am I feeling what I am feeling? 
Sometimes you may have to ask that why question two or three times until you get to the core issue. And then take what you find to God. Don't run away from him. That's the whole point of these things. God is with you in the workplace, surfacing these things inside of you that in any other situation you might never find out about yourself. And then focus on his greatness. Remember I talked about the power of music to integrate. Don't park with yourself. Yes, you need to look inside. You need to face the ugly side of it as well as the good side of it, just like David did. You need to take it to God, but then don't leave there. Finish like David did, O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. End with, O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Whether the in-between stuff is good about you or the in-between stuff shows you to be a coward and is afraid, doesn't matter. Sandwich it in the greatness of God and take it back to him. And if you can't quite sing in the workplace, because it might look odd if you suddenly burst out into song, I'm thinking of a friend of mine who one time on a very, very difficult day at work, just took his lunch hour and sang a song. That particular song is God, the world has never seen a God like you. As a worship leader in the church, he knew that song well. And he says, Sunda, it totally changed my whole framework by the time I came back to the workplace. It's all preparation for any exaltation that might come. Because if you, if you like this, there will be a day when God will exalt you. Or maybe not. But what you're doing in the valley, taking your cues from David, is what is getting you ready for your time in the workplace. And then, get in touch with yourself. Take what you find to God and then serve others around you. For David, the first task of a future king was to serve the present king. He was, first he was looking after sheep and after his anointing continued looking after sheep. Then he started serving King David. He was his armor bearer, protecting him physically and he sang, reshaping him spiritually on the inside. The first task of a future king was to serve the present king. Somebody else put it this way. I think it may have been Peterson. This, by the way, before David got into the workplace, we read in the story of Saul that the spirit departed from Saul and evil spirit came from him. The spirit left the palace from Saul. The spirit re-entered the palace when David walked in. What if you were to think of your workplace like that, that every time you went to work, the Holy Spirit is re-entering the workplace with you. You're taking church with you to people for five days in a week who will never show up in your church on a Sunday morning. The Holy Spirit is going with you to work every Sunday. You remember that cartoon, some of you may be old enough to remember that cartoon character Ziggy. And one time I was given a calendar with Ziggy cartoons. And this particular one, I'll never forget. It was one of these full length mirrors where you can see all of yourself. And Ziggy is looking at his reflection. He says, well, I guess it's you and me against the world today, right? And frankly, I think we're going to get creamed. That's what Ziggy says. But that's not what it has to be. It's, hey, Holy Spirit, you and I are going into the work, workplace. I wonder what you have in mind for me today. You see, nothing sticks out like a servant in the workplace. I remember a time at Atomic Energy of Canada, I was working, lunch hour, um, a couple of guys used to play chess, and most of the rest of us who weren't very good are the sideline kibitzers, watching, giving advice, making comments, etc., eating our lunch. And one time I remember I had a banana and I'd finished and I had to throw the banana peel, and there was no waste paper basket underneath me. And so, about seven feet across, another one of the kibitzers was watching, and there was a waste basket underneath. And I said, Hey, can you just Pass me the waste bucket. Nothing like service is there. And he kicked the bucket towards me. It was a simple request to pass a trash can. And he got so angry that he had to serve. That's the prevailing atmosphere. Nobody wants to serve. In that environment, servants stick out like a sore thumb. That's exactly what the mindset of Jesus is. Though he was equal with God, he did not count equality with God something to be grasped at. But he humbled himself, became obedient, poured himself into the form of a servant to exalt other people. I, I want to take a few moments to give tribute to my former senior pastor. For the first 16 years that I was at Rexdale of my pastoral ministry, I wasn't the senior pastor. I was the preaching pastor. 
Bud Downey, who was 16 years, 15 years my senior, was the senior pastor. And yet for 16 years, he was this kind of a servant to me. He practiced the mindset of Jesus in the workplace. I mean, he was a Bible college graduate. He had experience as a pastor. He had planted a church on his own. I had none of those things. I was an engineer. All I knew was to preach, more or less. And yet every Sunday morning, he would have to step back from the power position, the perceived power position in the church and allow a man 15 years his young, his junior, to, to preach and to teach. He did that. He always protected my time for study and prayer. Often in the winter on a Sunday morning when the uh, handicapped access ramp was covered with snow, Pastor Downey would be outside at minus 10, minus 15, minus 20 weather scraping the snow off while I was in my warm study, praying and studying. As a senior pastor, he could say, what are you doing in there? Get out here and work. Never once did he do that. Anytime there was an opportunity for me to go and get course, take courses in professional development, well, he never did it himself. He always sent me. He championed my application for my very first sabbatical after I'd been there for 14 years, even though he himself had never taken one. And when I was the main speaker at our denomination general assembly, he was my valet coming to, coming to the hotel every day to pick me up and take me to the venue for doing the preaching and teaching. And he did that not for one year, not for two years. He lived like that for 16 years. And I got all the credit as the preacher, right? Up front and center, you're the power position, you're the person people come and see. As I draw this message to a close, let me finish with the all-important how. How are we going to pull this off? The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 to 21. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. The, com the central command is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the power. Its effect is all relational. Speaking, singing, thanking, submitting. And the motivation out of reverence for Jesus. The Spirit filling me provides the power, this infusion of the life of Christ. The motivation though, is the magnificence of Jesus. And that's the work of the Spirit. Remember what Jesus said, "When I will not leave you alone, but when I go, I will send another, I will ask the Father for the Comforter, and He will come and minister to you. And what will He do? He will not speak about Himself. The Spirit will not glorify the Spirit. He said, He will take the things of me and make them known to you. The work of the Holy Spirit is to magnify Jesus to us, specifically magnifying the mindset of Jesus Christ. While the world all around us magnifies the mindset of the Tower of Babel. Let us build a tower. Let us build a name for ourselves. Let us climb the corporate ladder. Let us use people to get ourselves promoted. That's what the world puts on. And that's why the workplace is so toxic. The mindset of Jesus that comes to the workplace via the life of King David, the quintessential layman in the Bible, is a mindset that is the exact opposite equal with God, refusing to promote myself, making myself a servant, building other people up, waiting for God to exalt me in his time. That mindset doesn't look that attractive, right? The other one looks more attractive. What if people take advantage of a servant? That's the problem. Servants are taken advantage of and are being treated like servants. So something has to happen to us to make us want this. Because the other one comes naturally. That's what we want. Ambition, climbing the corporate ladder is what comes naturally. What doesn't come naturally but comes supernaturally is the Spirit filling us and the Spirit magnifying Jesus to us. So we actually say, I want to be like Jesus. Because I am adoring that. I love that. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's why... The central prayer of our lives needs to be, show me your glory. Moses didn't know anything about Jesus. He, he knew something about what was happening. 
He knew Yahweh. And he prayed, show me your glory. Today we pray with so much more understanding that the glory of God is Jesus. This is the gospel, right? God who commanded the light to shine in the darkness has shone in our hearts or to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So when we say today, Lord, show me your glory, <laughs> it's the glory of Jesus and the glory of Jesus specifically in the servant. Because that's what John said, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. And what does he say about the glory? Full of grace and truth. There were relational dimensions, grace and truth. And we begin to want that for us. That is the work of the Spirit. So my dear brothers and sisters, reflect on these for a moment. What does renewal in the place require or look like? First of all, confess pride and ambition whenever you see it. Secondly, Deepen your intimacy with yourself, know what's going on within, and your intimacy with God by taking what you find there to God. And thirdly, embrace humble service, the path of downward mobility, and wait for God to exalt you in due time. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus Jesus the name
At Bayview Glen, one of the ways that we show our devotion and worship God is through our giving. And so there's several ways that you can give. I would encourage you to go to bayviewglen.org slash give and find an option that works for you. Also, in the beginning, God said that it is not good for man to be alone. And the last two years have only confirmed this and shown us the value of community and also the importance of it for the Christian life. I don't, I don't think it's possible to overstate the value and importance of being part of a Christian community, a place to build relationships, to pray for one another, to grow together, and to love our neighbors. So if you are not currently in a life group, I would encourage you to go to bayviewglen.org slash give and find a life group near you. Now church, as you're sent out this week, may we be marked as those who have peace with God and share our peace with the world and use our work to glorify God's name and to help build up and share the love of Christ with our community. So may you go with the grace and peace of Jesus Christ. See you next week. Bye.